Hello all, and welcome back to Tangents on Cracked Spines. If you're new here, I am very glad, but maybe go back about two episodes uh, to start this particular story from the beginning. As always, I'm Frankie, and I'll be reading with unedited personal commentary on the classics or anything in the public domain. Uh, listener discretion is advised as some of the content holds adult themes and language and, you know, things like death that people don't feel are child appropriate. Uh, let's see. In the last episode, what happened? Wilbur's uh, grandpa dies. His mom just goes poof. Um, and he continues to grow at an accelerated rate while uh, attempting to uh, get his hands on a copy of the Necronomicon from various universities. Uh, however, the archivist at Miskatonic University was uh, who he went to first was like mm, yeah he's sketchy don't give him any copies so he didn't get any copies um, so he tried to sneak in we found out that they did indeed have electric alarm uh, security alarms at that point and yes I'm still going huh it shouldn't have been a surprise but it is um and we find out just how not human Wilbur is as he is described to us in great detail while he lays there dying because the guard dog anomanomed him. Police came and anything that wasn't a human part of him kind of melted away. So there wasn't much for the police to examine in the... Uh, university library and he did mumble some things on his way out of this mortal coil so we'll see how that fares for everybody else maybe we'll actually get to the actual Dunwich horror oh yeah I forgot to mention we're still on the Dunwich horror from HP Lovecraft I forgot to name the book I'm very sorry but we start back with chapter 7 Oh, hey, it starts off with what I just said. Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich Horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from the press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Watley. Or wait a Lee, I don't know. They found the countryside uh, countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the doomed hills, and because of the unwanted stench and the surging lapping sounds, which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by the Watley's boarded up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer, who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome boarded place. Now, remember from previous stories, noisome, while it is spelled N-O-I-S-O-M-E, which would make me think of something uh, auditory, means foul-smelling. And were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filled a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to be still in progress amongst the innumerable Watleys, decayed and undecayed, of the upper Mississippi Valley. An almost 
interminable manuscript and strange characters written in a huge ledger and adjudged a sort of diary because of the spacing and the variations in ink and penmanship presented a baffling puzzle to those who found it on the old bureau, which served as its owner's desk. After a week of debate, it was sent to Miskatonic University, together with the deceased's collection of strange books, for study and possible translation. But even the best linguists soon saw that it was not likely to be unriddled with ease. No trace of the ancient gold with which Wilbur and Old Watley always paid their debts has yet been discovered. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening, and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a, particular, a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to the ten-acre meadow with the cows. He was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside, the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps, Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey. Up there in the, in the road beyond the glen, Miss Corey, there's something there. It smells like thunder and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the road like they'd, uh, who's been moved along of it. And that ain't the worst, nother. They's prints in the road, Miss Corey. Great round prints as big as barrel heads, all sunk down deep like an elephant had been there long. Only they's a sight more than our four feet could make. I looked at one or two before I run, and I see every one was covered with lines spreading out from one place, like as if big palm leaf fans twixt or three times as big as any they is, had been pounded down into the rud, and the smell was awful, like it is around Wizard Watley's old house. Now, mind you, that accent is how it is written. So I am not personally making any commentary on a person's accent in that particular case. That is wholly how he writes the way these people speak. Just throwing that out there again. <laughs> Here he faltered and seemed to shiver afresh with the fright that had sent him flying home. Mrs. Corey, unable to extract more information, began telephoning the neighbors, thus starting on its rounds the overture of panic that heralded, heralded the major terrors. When she got Sally Sawyer, housekeeper at Seth's Bishop's, the nearest place to the Wallies, it became her turn to listen instead of transmit. For Sally's boy, Chauncey, who slept poorly, had been up on the hill toward Watley's and had dashed back in terror after one look at the place and at the pasturage where Mr. Bishop's cows had been left out all night. Yes, Miss Corey, came Sally's tremulous voice over the party wire. Chauncey just... He just came back a posting and couldn't have talked for being scared. He says old Watley's house is all blowed up with the timber scattered round like they've been dynamite inside. Only the bottom floor ain't though through, but is all covered with a kind of tar like stuff that smells awful and drips down off in the edges into the ground where the side timbers is blown away. And these awful kind of marks in the yard a great round marks bigger round than a hog's head and all sticky with stuff like is on a blowed up house. Chauncey, he says they leads off into the meadows where a great swath wide in a barn is matted down and all the stun walls tumbled ever which way where it goes. And he says, says he Miss Corey, as how he sought to look for Seth's cows Friends as he was, and found him up in the past upper pasture, nigh the devil's hop yard in an awful shape. Half of them's clean gone, and nigh half of them 
that's left is sucked most dry of blood with sores on them, like they've been on Watley's cattle ever since Lavinia's black brat was born. Oh, come on. Sorry. Sorry. Seth, he's gone out now to look at him. The I'll vow he won't care to get very now Wizard Watless. Chauncey didn't look careful to see what the big mockdown swath led out and it left the postage. But he says he thinks it pointed toward the glen run the village. I tell you, Miss Corey, they southern broaders had not to be broad. And I, for one, think that Wilbur Watley has come to the bad end he deserved, is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He won all human himself. I always say to everybody, and I think he and old Watley must have raised something in that there nailed up house as ain't even so human as he was. There's always been unseen things around Dunwich, living things as ain't human and ain't good for f human folks. The gown was a talking last night, and towards n morning, Chauncey, he heard the whippoorwill so loud in Cold Spring Glen, he couldn't sleep none. Then he thought he heard another faint like sound over towards Wizard Watley's. A kind of whipping old town of wood, like some big box or crate was being opened far off. What with this and that, he didn't get no sleep till at all till sun up, and no sooner was he up this morning, but he got to go over to Watley's and see what's the matter. He see enough, I tell you, Miss Corey. This done me no good, and I think as all the men folks ought to get up a party and do something. I know something awful's about. And feel my time is nigh, though only God knows just what it is. Did your Luther take count of where them big tracks led to? Nah? Well, Miss Corey, if they was on the Glenrod this side again and ain't got to your house yet, I calculate they must go into the Glen self. They'll do that. I'll say Cold Spring Glen ain't no healthy or decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was cre creators of God, and they's them as says ye can hear strange things a rushing and a talking in the air down there if you stand in the right place between the rock falls and bears den. By that noon, fully three quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were topping over the were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new-made Watley ruins and Cold Spring Glen. Exclaiming in horror, the vast monstrous prince, the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great sinister ravine, for all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice hang yeah, precipice hanging underbrush. It was as though a house launched by an avalanche had slid down through the tangled growths of an almost vertical slope. From below, no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable fetter. And it is not to be wondered at that the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue rather than descend and beard the unknown cyclopean horror in its lair. Beard. Wow. And beard the unknown cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than concoct a humorous paragraph about it, an item soon afterward reproduced by the Associated Press. That night, everyone went home, and every house and barn was barricaded and as stoutly as possible. Needless to say, no cattle were allowed to remain in open pasturage. About two in the morning, a frightful stench and the savage barking of the dogs awakened the household at Elmer Fry's on the eastern edge of Cold Spring Glen, and all agreed that they could hear a sort of muffled 
swishing or lapping sound from somewhere outside. Mrs. Fry proposed telephoning the neighbors, and Elmer was about to agree when the noise of splintering wood burst in upon their deliberations. It came apparently from the barn and was quickly followed by a hideous screaming and stamping amongst the cattle. The dogs slavered and crouched close to the feet of the fear-numbed family. Fry lit a lantern through force of habit, but knew it would be death to go out into the black farmyard. The children and the women folk whimpered. This was written in the 20s. This was written in the 20s. Kept from screaming by some obscure vestigial instinct of defense, which told them their lives depended on silence. At last, the noise of the cattle subsided to a pitiful moaning, and a great snapping, crashing, and crackling ensued. The fries, huddled together in the sitting room, did not dare to move until the last echoes died away far down in Cold Spring Glen. Then, amidst the dismal moans from the stable and the demonic piping of late whippoorwills in the glen, Selena Fry tottered to the telephone and spread what knew she could of the second phase of the horror. The next day, all the countryside was in a panic, and cowed, uncommunicative groups came and went where the fiendish thing had occurred. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle, only a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Watley, of a branch that hovered around halfway between sound and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practiced on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition ran strong, and his memories of chantings in the great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Darkness fell upon a stricken countryside too passive to organize for real defense. In a few cases, closely related families would band together and watch in the gloom under one roof, but in general there was only a repetition of the barricading of the night before and a futile, ineffective gesture of loading muskets and setting pitchforks handily about. Nothing, however, occurred except some hill noises, and when the day came there were many who hoped that the new horror had gone as swiftly as it had come. There were even bold souls who proposed an offensive expedition down in the glen, though they did not venture to set an actual example to the still reluctant majority. When night came again, the barricading was repeated, though there was less huddling together of families. In the morning, both the Fry and the Seth Bishop households reported excitement among the dogs and vague sounds and stenches from afar, while early explorers noted with horror a fresh set of the monstrous tracks in the road skirting Sentinel Hill. As before, the sides of the road showed a bruising indicative of the blasphemously stupendous bulk of the horror, whilst the confirmation of the tracks seemed to argue a passage in two directions, as if the moving mountain had come from Cold Spring Glen and returned to it along the same path. At the base of the hill, a 30-foot swath of crushed shrubbery saplings led steeply upward, and the seekers gasped when they saw that even the most perpendicular places did not deflect the inexorable trail. Whatever the horror was, it could scale a sheer stony cliff of almost completely verticality, and as the investigators climbed around to the hill's summit by safer routes, they saw the trail ended, or rather reversed, there. It was here that the Watleys used to build their hellish fires and chant their hellish rituals by the table-like stone on May Eve and Hollowmas. Now that very stone formed the center of a vast space, 
thrashed around by the mountainous horror, whilst upon its slightly concave surface was a thick and fetid deposit of the same tarry stickiness observed on the floor of the ruined Watley farmhouse when the horror escaped. Men looked at one another and muttered. Then they looked down the hill. Apparently the horror had descended by a route much the same of that as that of its ascent. To speculate was futile. Reason, logic, and normal ideas of motivation stood confounded. Only old Zebulon, who was not with the group, could have done justice to the situation or suggested a plausible explanation. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep. And about 3 a.m., all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receivers heard a fright-mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh my God! And some thought a crashing sound followed the breaking off of the exclamation. There was nothing more. No one dared do anything, and no one knew till morning whence the call came. Ah, the beauty of party lines. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and found that only the fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later, when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths of monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered. Only a stench and a tarry stickiness. The Elmer Fries had been erased from Dunwich. <laughs> Yeah, we got time for some more. Chapter 8 In the meantime, a quieter yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed door of a shelf-lined room in Arkham. The curious manuscript record or diary of Wilbur Watley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in language, both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaped Arabic used in Mesopotamia, being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher, though none of the usual methods of cryptography solution cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue even when applied on the basis of every tongue and writer tongue the writer might conceivably have used the ancient books taken from Watley's quarters while absorbingly interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science were of no assistance whatever in this matter one of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp, was in another unknown alphabet. This one of a very different cast and resembling Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Watley matter and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formula and antiquity of the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from old times and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that, considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formula and incantations. 
Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with the preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Dr. Armitage knew from the repeated failures of his colleagues that the riddle was a deep and complex one and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a trial. All through late August, he fortified himself with the massed lore of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of his own library and wadding night after night amidst the arcana of Trithmius's Polygraphia, Gimbatista Porta's De Fertis Literum Notus. I'm sorry, but if it's another language, don't put a hyphen there. Just, just move the whole thing to the next line. Devigne's Trate de Chief. And I apologize to anybody who speaks these languages because I botch everything. Falconer's Cryptomonisis Pacifata. Davies and Thicknesses, 18th century treatises, and such fairly modern authorities as Blair, Von Martin, and Kluber's Cryptographic. He interspersed his study of the books with attacks on the manuscript itself, and in time became convinced that he had to deal with one of those subtlest and most ingen ingenious of cryptograms. Wow, I can talk, I promise. In which many separate lists of corresponding letters are arranged like the multiplication table and the message built up with the arbitrary keywords known only to the initiated. The older authority seemed rather more helpful than the newer ones, and Armitage concluded that the code of the manuscript was one of great antiquity, no doubt handed down through a long line of mystical experimenters. Several times he seemed near daylight, only to be set back by some unforeseen obstacle. Then, as September approached, the clouds began to clear. Certain letters, as used in certain parts of the manuscript, emerged definitely and unmistakably, and it became obvious that the text was indeed in English. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and Dr. Armitage read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Watley's annals. It was in truth a diary, as all had thought, and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general Ill illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that Armitage deciphered, an entry dated November 26th, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, he remembered, by a child of three and a half who looked like a lad of twelve or thirteen. Today learn the Aklo for the Sabbath. Sabbath, it ran, which did not like it being answerable from the hill and not from the air. That upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain. Shot Elam Hutchkins Collie Jack when he went to bite me, and Elam says he would kill me if he dast. Mm -hmm. I guess he won't. Grandfather kept me saying the dough formula last night, and I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off. If I can't break through with the Dona formula when I commit it. They from the air told me at Sabbath that it will be years before I can clear off the earth. And I guess grandfather will be dead then. So I shall have to learn all the angles of the planes and all the formulas between the year and the new... Yeah. Sorry, it's literally just all vowels. Or not all vowels, all consonants. I know the different parts of uh, the alphabet, I promise. They from outside will help, but they cannot take body without human blood. That upstairs looks it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the vorish sign. 
or blow the powder of Imgazi at it. And it is near like them at May Eve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared and there are no earth beans on it. He that came with the Aklo Sabbath said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under the electric light, turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. He had nervously telephoned his wife that he would not be home, and when she brought him a breakfast from the house, he could scarcely dispose of a mouthful. All that day he read on, now and then halted maddening, maddeningly as a reapplication of the complex key became necessary. Lunch and dinner were brought him, but he ate only the smallest fraction of either. Toward the middle of the night, he drowsed off in his chair, but soon woke out of a tangle of nightmares almost as hideous as the truths and menaces to man's existence that he had uncovered. On the night of September 4th, Professor Rice and Dr. Morgan insisted on seeing him for a while and departed trembling and ashen gray. That evening, he went to bed, but slept only fitfully. Wednesday, the next day, he was back at the manuscript and began to take copious notes both from the current sections and from those he had already deciphered. In the small hours of that night, he slept a little in an easy chair in his office but was at the manuscript again before dawn. Some time before noon, his physician, Dr. Hartwell, called to see him and insisted that he cease work. He refused, intimating that it was of the utmost vital importance for him to complete the reading of the diary and promising an explanation in due course of time. That evening, just as twilight fell, he finished his terrible perusal and sank back exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half-comatose state, but he was conscious enough to warn her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander toward the notes he had taken. Weakly rising, he gathered up the scribbled papers and sealed them all in a great envelope, which he immediately placed in his inside coat pocket. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, But what in God's name can we do? Dr. Armitage slept, but was partly delirious the next day. He made no explanations to Hartwell, but in his calmer moments spoke of the imperative need of a long conference with Rice and Morgan. His wilder wanderings were very startling indeed including frantic appeals that something in a boarded-up farmhouse be destroyed, and fantastic references to some plan for the extirpation of the entire human race and all animal and vegetable life from the earth by some terrible elder race of beings from another dimension. He would shout that the world was in danger since the elder things wished to strip it and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos, of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen. Vig Vegetillions of eons ago. That's a new word for me. At other times, he would call for the dreaded Necronomicon and the Demonalteria of Remigus, in which he seemed hopeful of finding some formula to check the peril he conjured up. Stop them! Stop them! He would shout. Those Watleys meant to let them in, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur came here to his death. And at that rate, but Armitage had a sound uh, physique despite his 73 years and slept off his disorder that night without developing any real, fe real fever. Wait, 
What? First of all, I didn't realize he was that old a man. Second of all, he's going to be rambling and ranting, and then you're just... Uh, he, he slept it off. It's fine. <laughs> he woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober with a gnawing fear and tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon, he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference, and the rest of that day and evening, the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculation and the most desperate debate. And again, I have cats. I am sorry if you hear their noise in the background, because they apparently have the zoomies. Ah. All right. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stack shelves and from secure places of storage, and diagrams and formula were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of skepticism, there was none. Wow. Of skepticism, there was none. Is it normally spelled with a C? Hmm. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Watley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that, not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. Opinions were divided as to notifying the Massachusetts State Police, and the negative finally won. I mean, what are you going to tell uh, the police? Hey, we think that um, that person who got killed by the dog breaking in and dissolved in the library uh, may have brought something unnatural into this world. They're totally going to believe you. There were things involved which simply could not be believed by those who had not seen a sample, as indeed was made clear during certain subsequent investigations. Late at night, the conference disbanded without having developed a definite plan, but all day Sunday, Armitage was busy comparing formula and mixing chemicals obtained from the college laboratory. The more he reflected on the hellish diary, the more he was inclined to doubt the efficacy of any material agent in stamping out the entity which Wilbur Watley had left behind him. The earth-threatening entity, which, unknown to him, was to burst forth in a few hours and become the memorable Dunwich Horror. Monday was a repetition of Sunday, with Dr. Armitage, for the task in hand, required an infinity of research and experiment. Further consultations of the monstrous diary brought about various changes of plan, and he knew that even in the end a large amount of uncertainty must remain. By Tuesday, he had a definite line of action mapped out and believed he would try a trip to Dunwich within a week. Then, on Wednesday, the great shock came. Tucked obscurely away in a corner of the Arkham Advertiser was a fastidious little item from the Associated Press telling what a record-breaking monster the bootleg whiskey of Dunwich had raised up. Armitage, half-stunned, could only telephone for Rice and Morgan. Far into the night they discussed, and the next day was a whirlwind of preparation on the part of them all. Armitage knew he would be meddling with terrible powers, yet saw that there was no other way to annul the deeper and more malign meddling which others had done before him. And that's where we're going to end for the day, because <sighs> at 40 minutes, just about, I'm not going to get another 13 pages read. 
because that's what's left in the Dunwich Horror. So, thank you all for listening. Uh, for typical podcast business, if you enjoyed this, please subscribe, rate, review wherever you're listening. Um, obviously, five stars on uh, Apple uh, iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called, is highly appreciated because it's the most likely to get uh, me into more people's ears. But anything, any honest review helps me grow and, you know, produce better content for you. Although the content is really just me reading other people's work <laughs> and having opinions. Do, do, do. Uh, please share this with your friends if you think uh, any of them will like them. If you want to, you can reach out to me via toxpod at gmail.com. That's the initials phonetically Tango Oscar Charlie Sierra. Paris Oscar Delta at gmail.com. I blanked on the phonetic alphabet. Wow. On Facebook at Tangents on Crack Spines Book Club or with a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash Tangents on Crack Spines. Uh, we do have uh, updates posted and polls to vote. Um, I'm going to put that. Uh, poll on this episode uh, where I can. Please comment your suggestions because as we're wrapping up, we're only going to have one more episode. Your options for the next bit of uh, reading. I continue on with another uh, 10 to 15 episodes of H.P. Lovecraft Stories. I do a collection of Edgar Allan Poe works. I read Bram Stoker's Dracula, which will probably take us through the end of the year. Let's face it, it's a very long and draw book. Or the Nonsense Anthology. Please let me know either in the comments or via any of the things I had stated to contact me. Or in a poll. What would you like me to read next? And if it's something that's not that, go ahead and let me know that too. Again, my bookworms, thank you for listening. And have a wonderful day. Or night. I know some people listen to this to fall asleep. I'm that boring. <laughs>